everyone and welcome to the Garuda tutorial for clock making part 2. Uh, in this tutorial we're going to take a look at going from a design such as the Garuda clock on the screen to a finished uh, clock such as this one. They're both the same clock, some minor adjustments and changes in CAD as I went along simply to decorate it and make it look different. Um, this is the Garuda clock as you see it in the project screen from a freshly loaded uh, erotic project. As you can see, it's got a couple of changes from uh, what we started with. The gear train at the very top of the clock, inside the deadbeat at the top, uh, used to be sharing the deadbeat shaft. Uh, we moved it up in order to get everything off of the deadbeat shaft other than the deadbeat gear itself, uh, the gear it turns, and the second hand. Clocks are a little different than most mechanisms that you would build, and that's the reason that we're doing this tutorial. Normally, we wouldn't even begin to tell you how to build something, but a lot of people don't have experience with building something which gears up. Normally you start with a motor doing a certain RPM and you might make, for example, a 40 to 1 reduction. That would be a typical project. In clock, however, you're stepping up the speed by thousands of times. Uh, because of that, we're going to take a look at it. The questions we've received are range from how do I make face plates um, so that uh, axles don't uh, cut off gears and that there's no interference. And how can I build this thing so it goes together? As I said, we've moved this shaft upwards from here. Um, this was done to reduce friction. There is an extreme dedication that you have to put to making sure there is no friction in your clock. The deadbeat gear should turn uh, almost by blowing on it, uh, even though you have a spring assembly or a weight assembly on it. The deadbeat uses an uh, extremely small amount of energy as it rotates, and it has to impart that energy into the pendulum to keep the clock going. So because of that, you have to pay very close attention to the friction in your clock. Starting at the deadbeat gear, it should turn very freely, and the uh, friction and stiction become less important as you move out from the deadbeat gear through your gear train towards the uh, weight wheel. Um, in this case, I decided to use, instead of a weight wheel, uh, a ratchet. Uh, this ratchet has a 7-day clock spring in it, although I have it on a half-hour gear, so it runs something less than 12 hours, uh, which is fine for a demonstration clock. This clock is meant to be a work of art, not a timekeeper. Uh, no pun intended. Um, I'm going to show you, by looking through some of the uh, changes that I made in CAD, um, how we decorate a clock and how we put it together. Um, it's my hope that this will help point out the way to some of you who might have questions on what exactly uh, you have to do in order to build your clock. Eurotic motion is meant for conceptualizing it. Um, so the question is, how do I go from there to building it? first thing that you need to uh, work on when you want to start building the project is you have to look at your uh, front plate.dxf that Grotic Motion puts out for every project that you do. You don't have to select that output. It's not automatically generated when you uh, generate a project. You also get top plates, side plates, and, and so on, but for the purposes of the clock, all you need is that front plate. We're going to load that into Vectric. I tend to use uh, V-Carve for almost everything I do just because in addition to being a great little uh, CNC CAM program it's also very easy to use in its CAD format so I tend to use it for everything. These are the shafts as they come out in that program. Uh, when you design a clock you'll very quickly become familiar with exactly what those, do what those sh dots, which shafts those dots are representing I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, you'll memorize your clock in no time flat, and you'll pretty much know where every shaft is. Um, for example, this shaft is the deadbeat itself, uh, and then we, in that order, go uh, from low uh, ratio up to gradually higher ratios. This is our time uh, driver, the ratchet wheel, and it's hooked to that 25-minute uh, wheel. So to go from here to generate uh, face plates, uh, it's a pretty simple process really. All you have to do is draw a shape which would be freestanding in the case of a mantle clock, which encompasses all of those shafts. What I tend to do uh, in Vectric is simply draw some lines between all of the shafts 
and uh, enter some circle, larger circles on them, join them with lines, and uh, create my faceplates. You can have more than two faceplates. Sometimes you might want three, depending on how you're separating your gears. Uh, you might even want four. But let's take a look at how I draw these things up and uh, what you can do to kind of match the same process. Alright, so for my process, I uh, start by simply looking at the shafts and picking a symmetrical kind of shape that I want to you know, make whatever looks good to you. I generally start by drawing large circles around each of the shafts. Those will be my support circles. And uh, since the shaft in this clock are uh, five millimeter, uh, 10 millimeter bearing holes, um, what I do is draw about a 20 millimeter circle around uh, each of these shaft points. Um, I'll push the screen forward a little bit so that you can see the generation of those circles. Okay, so now we have um, circles to support each uh, bearing. So I'm going to just symmetrically join the center of these um, bearing holes together with lines and do a simple offset left and right of say five or six millimeters on a side um, to start to create a support structure. By removing all of the uh, intersecting circles and lines we can create a base frame. And the process here is to create a frame which is encompasses every shaft. So I try to make it look symmetrical and then I gradually join in the other shafts until I have something that will support my gear shafts um, while I play with them and make sure that everything works and everything spins together well and backlash is good. And then I can start with this basic frame that's in front of us and from there generate a full out clock frame. But this frame I made several iterations of as I went through the clock uh, just so I could sit on my desktop and hold them together. You would of course make two copies of this if you want two face plates. Uh, for holding your mechanism together. So once you have this base frame built up, you're uh, pretty much ready to start putting your clock together. Again, all these holes represent bearing points for me because I put a bearing in every spot. Here you can see what I did in the end with that base frame by just adding a circle and some uh, inlay cutouts so that I could push white acrylic into clear acrylic. I added a couple of legs which are basically two ellipses um, at the bottom. At the top of the clock, at the 12 o'clock position, you can see a hole which is 28 millimeters round and it holds a Canadian $2 coin, uh, which is why we call this clock a toonie clock around here. There are actually uh, five toonies in the clock. Uh, in the event that the clock didn't work, we wanted to be able to say it at least had a $10 value to it uh, as Canadian currency. Uh, to the right of it, you know, I just pointed to here, you can see the uh, foot frame. Uh, this is just meant to set on the table as a base and hold the two plates a set distance apart. Uh, I'll explain how to get that set distance in a bit. Here are the letters that uh, I cut out to inlay into the frame. These are all just changes that I make to bureautics drawings in order to make them work for me. Here's an earlier iteration of the uh, main frame. This one would actually stand up by itself, but it had no way of displaying how many minutes, uh, hours, or seconds. You can see several gears that came along with it. There's also two poles on this screen, you'll notice. Uh, we used two at the suggestion of one of our users, and he was quite right. By doubling up the pole width, um, it absorbs any wobbles that you might have in your deadbeat. Your deadbeat should run pretty true, of course. But if there are any wobbles, having two poles glued together uh, works fabulously to make the thing work. You'll also see all these round rings here. I use these for spacing my clock. It's very hard to put grub screws on the shaft of an acrylic gear. So in order to solve that problem, I do this in wooden clocks as well. I cut many rings which friction fit onto the shafts. And by gluing the faces of all these small rings together, um, I create a shaft that I can hold my hand permanently which all the gears are properly separated all the spaces are the same since all gears are cut to the same thickness as the rings um, you can simply count how many rings that you have on your shaft 
and it gives you an idea as to the distance to place your uh, clock frames apart. You'll see that in photographs of the uh, clock when we go through it. Um, obviously, since I'm cutting with a laser, I'm kind of dragging bits and pieces out of the various DXFs and placing them onto a cut sheet, uh, and the laser then cuts all that out. You, of course, will be cutting them either in CNC with G-code directly from Gerotic, or with something like uh, V-Carve, which can also create the G-code for you after you've manipulated the shapes of the various uh, items that you want to decorate on the clock. So here we can see some more modifications I made as we went further along with the clock. Um, you can see on the pawls, I added a tuning hole uh, to the top of the pawl. As long as you keep the pallets the right distance apart, you're free to modify your uh, pawl as much as you wish. You should keep it symmetrical to keep the weight balanced uh, the same on either side, but it really has no uh, general effect at all having weight on top of your pawl. Um, on the left hand side of the screen you can see these spacers which are meant to uh, clip between the faces of the clock to hold them a set distance apart. They aren't really required in the case of this clock when you're finished but when you're playing with the gears on your desktop uh, adjusting for backlash and so on they're very handy to hold things together for you. Pick what CAD size I should put. This is my uh, clock winding ratchet I simply took a uh, Mod 2 gear and modified it so it would uh, take some ends of tie wraps that I cut to fit into these slits to act as the locks for the ratchet. Uh, these three wheels to the right with notches in them uh, are where the mainspring um, latches into. And these three plates are glued together and then pressed onto the shaft. And uh, the more plates you glue together, the more the friction will be on the shaft, and it'll hold your gears quite tightly without having to worry about grub screws and things like that that can uh, really be a pain when you're trying to design something out of acrylic. This is the pendulum. Uh, it holds three Canadian $2 coins, three toonies, to bring it up to its $10 value. Uh, you can see I made kind of a comb shape so that I could move the uh, pendulum up and down in the comb and uh, by doing that make it shorter or longer to adjust for time if the clock wasn't accurate. Uh, as long as you start with the base length that periodic motion gives you and allow yourself a few millimeters up or down on that length, you should be fine as far as uh, timing in your clock is concerned. So with all that having been said, I guess we can take a look at the real clock and it might give you uh, a better idea of how exactly uh, you can fit one together. This, of course, is the clock as it stands. You'll notice that uh, the second hand and the minute hand seem to share a shaft, even though they don't uh, really. The minute hand, the one in behind, is, on, um, is glued to a gear which is on a bearing which is on the deadbeat shaft. It's actually rotated by uh, the gear coming out at about the 130 position. That's the half hour wheel. A half hour wheel then goes on a 2 to 1 to turn to uh, make our minute hand. The second hand simply pushes gently onto the deadbeat shaft. Um, Semi snug fit so I can uh, rotate it around if I need to. You can see the winding mechanism and how it uh, comes through the front of the clock. Um, at the very top, you can see the Canadian toonie, which rocks back and forth with the pawl. And at the 12 o'clock position, another toonie. You can't very clearly see the pendulum in this particular picture, um, but it also has three toonies. You can see I doubled up the base to give it uh, a bit more support. And you can see one of my spacing clips on the left-hand side at the bottom. That's uh, just a remnant for me putting it together the last time and really isn't required to hold it together. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, clock from the side. This side uh, has the deadbeat gear to the very left. The uh, planetary gear that serves as the hour hand is to our right. And you can see multiple uh, layers of plexiglass in the middle. That uh, is our barrel, which surrounds the uh, wind-up spring. You can also see the uh, banks of gears that are in there. And you'll notice that you can't see the shafts, and that's because the shafts are fully covered with either a gear or a spacer plate. As I said earlier, 
makes it very easy to space your clock. Um, I basically go by the rule, if there's no gear at that spot, put a spacer. If there's a gear, put the gear instead. And at the end of it, you'll uh, be able to see what is the minimum distance between the plates, and you can adjust it thicker if you wish, simply by adding a spacer to each of the shafts. And here's a close-up photo of the second hand and the minute hand. Uh, you can see what I've done is just take a few rings of white acrylic, glued them all together to make a little uh, plug, which plugs right on the end of the deadbeat shaft. Uh, under that second hand, you can see the minute hand, which is simply slightly snugly fit to a round ring of acrylic, which is glued to the gear beneath it. That gear rides on a bearing on the deadbeat shaft. Uh, the gear itself is rotated by, you can see the gear meshed into it, which is on the half-hour uh, wheel of the gear train. This way it looks like uh, the second hand and the minute hand are sharing a shaft, but really they're driven by two different things, but simply end up in the same spot. So here's a close-up view into the um, center of the clock, and you can see that we have a, uh, a shaft in the center of the screen the deadbeat shaft itself, so that you can see the deadbeat hanging to one side of the uh, frame that stands on the table, and then you'll see a space. I always leave a space on the shaft so the shaft can freely move back and forth uh, if there is pressure pushing it that way. Uh, it just tends to keep the friction down so you don't get a uh, one of those round discs rubbing against the acrylic on the back. But if this is a good example of how you can see a shaft in this case is built up of five spacers, a gear, and uh, one more spacer. So it's seven spacers thick. All the shafts are then made to have seven spacers thick of gears or spacers on them. Um, and at that point you can just shove an end plate on either side and it will hold all your gears together. This also makes it very easy to take your clock apart and put it back together again. If I am to remove the face plate of this clock, those three shafts simply uh, tumble out with their gears all attached and things don't run all over the table. You can simply pick them up and plug them in as if they're Lego bricks and the clock is back into running condition. Uh, these spacers I found work well on wooden clocks as well. Um, if you're using a brass rod, for example, inside a wooden clock, uh, you just cut wooden discs and by gluing them together and pressing them all into the shaft and gluing them to the gears as well, you end up with a brass rod with several uh, wooden gears and spacers on them which are kind of a permanent fixture so that they pull out of the clock and push into the clock easily. And it makes disassembly and reassembly uh, simple. Here's a view of the garotic clock at the top. You can see that um, I have the one shaft going between two bearings which are pressed into the uh, face plates. I then put a little acrylic spacer and, a, uh, and the pawl, which also has a bearing pushed into it. Uh, sorry, the pawl, uh, actually the whole cut in the pawl is tight to the shaft. By having a double pawl thickness, we can push it and friction fit it to the shaft. The pendulum is a looser fit so that I can grab the pawl at any time and adjust the pendulum for the level of the clock. Uh, sometimes that's done with a verge or a uh, crutch arrangement. Um, you might want to look that up on Google to see how they join uh, pendulums to shafts. There are a variety of ways of doing it, some lower friction than others. Uh, some use a spring steel uh, ribbon as a uh, holder of their pendulum. There are a great many ways to do it, and uh, I wouldn't pretend to know which is best. Uh, in this clock, this method worked very well for me. If the clock wasn't sitting level, I could simply hold the paw, slightly tweak the pendulum in either direction to make sure that when the pendulum is sitting straight down, the paw is balanced. Uh, side to side. At that point, a sim simple uh, push on the pendulum will start this clock ticking. Here's a closer look at the top of the clock. You can see how the uh, little 10 millimeter bearings I just simply pushed into the plastic. They were cut to be a tight friction fit. The shaft uh, pushes through the bearings. I don't even clip the end. It, uh, the shaft has no lateral uh, thrust, so it doesn't pull itself out, but I can pull the pole off if I wish. The pawl with the Canadian $2 coin is friction fit onto that shaft and the pendulum hangs behind it. Uh, you can see I use two clips at the top. These are the only two clips that I leave in the clock and they simply hold the uh, top of the frame 
the right distance apart. Everything else is kind of self-holding. And just to decorate the clock a little bit, uh, here's the number six out of white acrylic pressed into the clear acrylic uh, to give us the six o'clock position. And in the back of it, you can just see the three tunies in the pendulum as it sits at, uh, at low point. And here's the time um, keeper of the clock, the mainspring. Um, as you can see, we cut a few tie wraps and simply shove them into slits on a two module gear, put a ratchet on the inside. The end of the shaft was uh, ground down to take a four millimeter uh, socket and I just used a little ratchet to wind it up with. Uh, that ball looking thing at the top is the end of a seven day um, mainspring and I simply cut several rings of acrylic uh, with a hole in it so that you could just push the mainspring right into that barrel. Uh, the ratchet uh, gear sits right in front of the barrel and it meshes into our half hour wheel. Pretty simple arrangement. And here's a close up of the bottom leg. As I said, that clip um, would normally not be there. It's not required except when you're putting it together. Um, also in the foreground here we can see the planetary gear which is our hour hand. Um, to do that I simply hung a planetary gear on a gear with two flat rings around it which hold the gear in place so that the planetary can't fall off. In retrospect, this hour hand can jam and it will stop the clock sometimes after a few hours because I only used three pivot points for the planetary gear. Anybody even thinking about using a planetary gear, I'd suggest four gears to hold it at equidistant angular positions. It would keep the uh, planetary gear from binding up on you. And that's it. I hope that you uh, have some luck in building your own clocks. Feel free to contact us at Garabic if you have questions on uh, what you're doing while you're building your clock, or if you have some results to show us, we'd uh, love to see them. Have fun. Thanks for listening.